So uh, with that, it's my pleasure to invite our next speaker up, Ginevra Allen. Ginevra is an associate professor of statistics and compu uh, computer science and electrical and computer engineering at Rice. Uh, she's first and foremost in statistics and a statistician. Um, she's also a member of the the Jane and Dan Duncan Neurological Research Institute at the Texas Children's Hospital and Baylor College of Medicine, where she holds George's appointment. Um, she's a recipient of several uh, honors, including the National Science Career Award, which is a prestigious uh, NSF award uh, you get, um, the International uh, Biometric Society of Young Statisticians Showcase, um, and but in 2014, Dr. Allen was named to the Forbes 30 Under 30 uh, sci in Science and Healthcare. So with that, Ginevra, it's all yours. Okay, uh, thanks so much, Jan. Um, so today I'm talking about clustering and particularly some methodological developments and also how we visualize our clustering results. So you guys probably know a lot about clustering uh, in this audience. Very simply, we want to find groups in data, okay? So we might want to find groups of observations, features, data come in all different forms. And clustering is incredibly important. For example, if you're Russia, you might want to find groups of voters to target with ads on social media, um, <laughs> is one nefarious example of clustering. But of course, there's lots of, of, of really uh, uh, important applications of clustering out there. Um, and so just some motivations. Um, so one of the areas that I work in is uh, cancer genomics. And clustering has been really important in cancer genomics because of the ability to find what are called subtypes. And that's the idea that every disease is not um, just one disease. For example, breast cancer is not just breast cancer, or ovarian cancer is not just ovarian cancer, but instead to have a bit more personalized approach with precision medicine. And the idea here is to, based on genomic profiles, find groups of patients who behave similarly or who have similar clinical manifestations of the disease or similar genomic profiles. And of course, this is critically important now because then we can, once we find these subgroups of patients, we can build drugs that are directly tailored to that group of patients based on their genome. Okay, so this is one really important application. And so what I'm going to talk about today is a little bit more fun since we have a diverse audience here. But just keep in mind what I'm actually using these methods that I developed for is cancer genomics. I work with scientists uh, across the street at Baylor College of Medicine um, on lots of cancer genomics projects there. And also actually some genomics in neuroscience and Alzheimer's disease as well is what we're really using these methods on. But uh, today I'm going to have a little bit more fun examples, and one uh, very fun example of how clustering is used is text mining. And there's lots of ways of digitally analyzing text. Think about all the text data out there on Twitter, on the internet, and social, social media, websites, there's just a huge corpus of text out there. And there's lots of different ways to analyze them. One way of doing so is called a bag of words model. And this is a really, really simple way to do this. Imagine taking your text document and chopping it up into individual words and simply counting how many times each word appeared in each document. Okay? So you might have something that looks like this where, whoops, okay, the laser's not working. Anyway, I'm going to point. Um, you might have something that looks like this where these are, might be words that you hear in this talk today. Um, and say you have six different documents, and here you just have the count of how many times each word appears in the document. Clustering is really important for applications like this to understand what types of topics the different documents are on and also which words tend to go together and what are the groups of words that uh, differentiate these sets of documents for topics, okay? Um, so there's lots of different clustering approaches out there. You're probably familiar with the basics, k-means, hierarchical clustering. So I work with scientists a lot across the street in the med center, and they 95% of what they do when they do clustering is hierarchical clustering, which of course is represented using, oh, the laser keeps not working, uh, which is represented using this tree-like structure called a dendogram. Okay, and um, there's a lot of real advan oh, excellent. 
I have laser now. Excellent. Dendogram. There we go. Okay. Um, and so uh, there's a reason why these techniques are so popular. So just to review really quickly what they do is at the bottom of the dendogram represents each individual data point. And then as we move up the dendogram, data points fuse together if they are similar to each other. And as you go up, they form groups. And you can see here, if you cut the dendogram right here, we get three groups, which I colored in these three different colors. So there's lots of ways here to understand this as groups. Why is this method used so much in clustering? First, it's super fast, OK? So it's really fast. It's also very simple, right? And it's also very easy to interpret and a very appealing visualization right here. You don't have to be a data scientist to understand the groupings that are coming out from a visual representation of, of your data like this. Okay? So a lot of really great advantages, but there's a lot of disadvantages also. So if you've worked with hierarchical clustering, you need to specify your distance and your linkage and all sorts of things like this. The shape of the dendrogram can dramatically change based on what type of tuning parameters you set it to. It's very hard to select those tuning parameters in a data-driven manner. So any, how many clusters, what types of tuning parameters should I use, how should I conduct inference is very, very difficult. And the other thing, as a statistician, everything that I like to do, I like to make my analysis reproducible and do reproducible uh, uh, data-driven research. And that's really difficult with hierarchical clustering because very small changes to your data can yield completely different looking dendrograms. Okay? So there's some real disadvantages here. And how uh, can we... Uh, correct those. So just before I move on, just uh, one other quick thing. So a bi-clustering is finding uh, groups in, say, both row space and observation space if your data is organized as a matrix or, or more if your data is organized differently. And it's just applying hierarchical clustering to the columns and the rows of your matrix simultaneously and reorganizing your matrix and visualizing this as a heat map. So here, each element here is uh, uh, that's yellow means some large value, and blue means some very low value of this particular data set. Okay? So we want to develop some methods to improve upon hierarchical clustering. And so recently, in the machine learning literature, uh, several have proposed different methods for formulating convex approaches to clustering and bi-clustering. So for those of you uh, that, that haven't had math for a while in this class, why con uh, not class, sorry, I, I give too many lectures, I, I forget, okay, in, the, in this room. Um, so uh, why convex? So convex problems give us um, that we can solve the convex problem in a polynomial time algorithm and we're guaranteed to find the global solution. That's a really big deal when it comes to clustering because clustering is inherently an NP-hard problem. And there are very few guarantees on how well we can do with clustering techniques that only give local solutions, such as hierarchical clustering and k-means uh, clustering. But with these types of methods, we're going to have a global solution guaranteed by how we formulate them and much superior mathematical and statistical properties. And so let me show you what I mean by convex clustering. Whoops, I'm going the wrong way here. And by clustering. So here is the optimization problem that gives convex clustering. And what you're looking at here, just kind of focus on the colors here. This is a loss function here. Assume we've got each observation in our data is x. And every uh, observation gets its own potential cluster centroid that we're going to call U here. And here, this is a fusion penalty that is going to mimic the process that is going on in hierarchical clustering, but with a convex fusion penalty. What this penalty does is it takes the U's, or the cluster centroids, for two different observations, and it forces them to come together, and eventually they will exactly fuse and become a cluster. And so what happens here is this lambda is called a tuning parameter or a regularization parameter. And that forces, as lambda increases, it forces more and more data points to fuse together. And so what you get when lambda equals zero, every observation is its own potential cluster. And as lambda increases, fusions occur. And eventually, all your data fuses together. Okay? So I think this is easiest to understand via a picture. 
Okay, so this is a really silly example here where clearly there's five uh, clusters in this very uh, small toy example data set. I'm going to plot the cluster centroids in blue. Okay, so when lambda equals zero, you don't see any of the cluster centroids. They're exactly the data points when lambda equals zero. As I increase lambda a little bit, you see the cluster centroids start moving together a little bit more, and all of a sudden we have five different clusters in this data set. The centroids have fused into five groups. Here we have three groups, three groups, and when lambda is very large, eventually all of your data uh, fuses together and you have uh, a, a one cluster. So this is a really cool way of a convex formalization of getting what we, uh, the types of information we are getting from hierarchical clustering. Well, what about bi-clustering, which is uh, clustering the rows and the columns simultaneously? We can do the same type of thing. And here, this problem, every element of our matrix now has its own potential bi-cluster centroid, and we have a fusion penalty on the rows of our matrix and a fusion penalty on the columns of our matrix that force them to fuse into clusters or bi-clusters. And just as before, this lambda controls both the cluster assignments and the number of bi-clusters, and importantly, um, unlike the cluster heat map and hierarchical clustering, the bi-clustering of the rows and the columns is done simultaneously and together here with lambda. And we get something very similar. So I'm going to show you this is just a heat map. I'm just showing you a heat map of individual um, matrix elements here. Um, so here, watch our rows and our columns here. Again, yellow is high values and blue is low values. When lambda equals zero, we see our original data that we have. When lambda increases, we start seeing some co rows and columns fuse together a little bit and form potential groups. Some more fusions, some more fusions, more fusions. You see a very clear group structure there, a very clear checkerboard-like group structure there. And eventually, when lambda is very large, we get the, the global mean of our data. OK, cool. So there's a lot of advantages um, to these, and I'm not going to go into any of the statistical or mathematical properties of these approaches, but a lot of people have studied these. There's, there's some great, great work on this. And I think the main takeaway is that these yield very stable and reproducible results. You can show mathematically that small changes to your data or your parameters do not dramatically change your results, okay? This also comes with great statistical consistency guarantees that go beyond what hierarchical clustering and k-means clustering has. And also, this is a huge advantage here. We have one tuning parameter. We don't have a combinatorial number of tuning parameters like we do in hierarchical clustering, if you've ever worked with these methods before. There's just one tuning parameter to worry about. But there's going to be some issues here that we're going to um, attempt to deal with. So what we really want to do with this, so this was, um, I just reviewed some of my previous work on uh, comics clustering and bi-clustering. But um, what we wanted to do is I saw these methods and I was like, we can use these to create really awesome visualizations of your data. I want to basically make movies that shows you how your data is going to group together. Okay, so and also interactive movies. And specifically, what we need to do to make this work is we want to develop dendrograms and cluster heat maps. So take those visualizations that everybody already uses and knows and loves for hierarchical clustering and say, can we do this for convex clustering and bi-clustering? And also create movies out of these. So here's an example of what I'm just giving you a quick preview of the type of thing we want to do. We want to take these data matrices. And this is a convex bi-clustering solution here. Um, sorry, the lighting's a little bit poor. It's a little hard to see. But we can create a movie for how our data is grouping together and how it forms groups. Um, but there's some issues, of course. So this, uh, uh, this is not uh, a trivial problem. If it was, uh, people probably would have already done it. Um, there's a couple, there's a theoretical issue that there's potential fissions that occur. You can't mathematically rule out, except in very uh, specific circumstances, whether fissions will occur. Fissions are, imagine two data points have come together as a group, and then later on, as lambda increases, they come apart. So this is a, a, a big problem mathematically to deal with. But the other big thing is, is a computational issue. 
So it is just too slow. So particularly what current algorithms would do to form a dendrogram is imagine going up in that one tuning parameter lambda, which controls the extent of our clustering assignments. Imagine we have to go up and at every rung of the tree of the dendrogram we're looking at, we have to be able to find the exact lambda value to compute the dendrogram. Okay? This is computationally incredibly slow. I mean incredibly slow on the order of for a data set with n equals 100 observations, this algorithm did not finish in 24 hours using the current state-of-the-art <coughs> algorithm for convex uh, clustering. Okay? So imagine, I work with scientific collaborators a lot, imagine say for their small size data set saying, oh no, let me start this running for 24 hours and I'm going to come back just so you can look at a, a visualization of your data. Right? That's, that's not quite going to work. So how can we solve this? So what we're going to do is totally bizarre. So those of you that have a math background and optimization background, I'm going to do something slightly sacrilegious, but bear with me. Um, and it's called algorithmic regularization pass. So the idea of this method is, so classical regularization pass, what do they do? So for those of you that don't know about this or don't care, go to sleep for the next two minutes and come back when the pretty pictures start. Um, OK, so for those of you that care a little bit more about the math details, um, so what do you do to actually compute? If you wanted to compute the entire convex clustering solution path, what would you do? You start with lambda equals 0, and there's no fusions in your data, or there's no cluster assignments. You, um, and then you increase the lambda, or the regularization level, by a very tiny amount. You solve the convex optimization problem. And currently, the fastest state-of-the-art method is an AMA, or alternating minimization algorithm. This is the current state-of-the-art for this. And you solve the full optimization problem at lambda. And we iterate this AMA algorithm updates until convergence. And typically, this algorithm takes on the order of hundreds to thousands of iterates to converge and reach the solution. And then we increase lambda by another tiny amount, and so forth. So at the end of the day, we might try this out for 10,000 different values of lambda. And say, even if we have 100 updates of AMA, that's a lot of updates that we had to compute to compute this solution path. Okay. So, so what we're going to do is a little bit crazy, but bear with me. Instead, we're going to say, do the following. We're going to start at the exact same point where every observation is its own cluster. There's no regularization. And we're going to perform one iterate of the AMA algorithm. So not iterate till convergence, do not solve an optimization problem, update one iterate, and then update the regularization level by a tiny amount, and repeat. Perform one iterate, and then update the regularization level by a tiny amount, and repeat until all your observations have fused together. Okay? And we call this method for convex clustering CARP. So my students name this. I, I don't see them in the room, so I can slightly make fun of them. But um, uh, so uh, uh, CARP for convex clustering via algorithmic regularization pass. And we can also do this for convex by clustering, or in other words, CBAS. Um, uh, it, for those machine learners in the room, you know that you always have to like find acronyms. I'm not sure these are close. But you have to find acronyms for your methods, right, to, to get them to sell. So just to show you the algorithm, don't worry at all about the math here. I'm just showing you that the change in the code for this is extremely tiny. The red line here is the only thing that has changed. And here I'm just increasing the regularization level uh, geometrically on a geometric scale by a tiny amount at each iteration. Okay, So very tiny changes there. And uh, this is very fast to do, so typically on the order of seconds. Okay, And so look at these two plots here. These are two plots of convex clustering solution paths. Can anybody see any difference between them? Hopefully not. Um, one of them is, so, so one of these is, that, is the solution from running at 10,000 different values of lambda of the convex clustering uh, solution pass using ex existing algorithms. And this is our method via algorithmic regularization pass right here. And we can actually show that as the step size goes to 1, 
they actually exactly coincide. So doing this crazy thing that is not solving an optimization problem is in fact solving these problems in the limit. And we get very, very close empirical results, meaning if we take t very close to 1, we actually do get uh, machine 0 of this Hausdorff distance, which is a distance to compare two objects of different lengths on different scales. Okay? So, um, so cool. So we're actually solving convex clustering just in a really, really fast way by doing this crazy uh, algorithm. I should say, I mentioned there was a couple other things, uh, particularly the fission issue. And um, we have uh, faster approximations, which are the, the visualization algorithms that also that are specifically tuned to find dendrograms by adaptively updating the step size so you find every single rung of that tree in the dendrogram algorithm and also preventing fissions. Um, so just some quick timing results. This is the data set on presidents, which we're actually going to come back to in a little bit. And um, right here are the current state of the arts method in terms of timing. I should say these are on a log scale, not a linear scale. Okay? And these are our methods here at various step sizes and our visualization method. Um, this is a pretty small data set, n equals 45 here, because there's 45 US presidents. I'm coming back to this example. Um, but the more important results are these are the current state of the art algorithms in terms of dendrogram recovery. How much of that dendrogram were they able to recover correctly via these algorithms? And, and it's very small. It's actually uh, some of these are, that are faster are only can recover about 25% of the dendrogram, whereas our method recovers 95% of the dendrogram correctly. Um, this is another data set where n is about 900 and p is larger also, so a little bit larger um, scale data set. And these are the current state of the arts, and three of these methods did not finish in a 24-hour time period. Okay, so they did, not, they did not run. This one took around 15 hours. Our CARP-VIS method took about an hour and 15 minutes. Again, this is a log scale, so this took a little bit longer, but these results are striking. This is, the per this is the percentage of the dendrogram that these methods were able to recover correctly in the given uh, time. And you see here that we actually find here, I think it's like 94% of the dendrogram correctly. Um, and this took about an hour to do for n equals 900. And n equals 900 dendrograms are pretty hard to see anyway, right? So typically we would do this for smaller examples, okay? Um, also, you might ask the accuracy. Um, we're doing something that's kind of crazy and not solving the optimization problem. Here's the accuracy in blue of all of your favorite hierarchical clustering methods with a combination of different distances and linkages. K means here is an aqua. And these red and gold colors are our methods. One means perfect clustering recovery. This is an author data set that's well known um, and used in machine learning examples for clustering, where we know the labels here, the cluster labels. And we perform better than every single other combination of hierarchical clustering that's out there and k-means on these data sets. This is also, we tried this out on four other data sets as well in the paper. And, and we do quite a bit better than all of them on these. Okay. So I want to end with a fun example um, on uh, a US president's data set. And this data set came about because my student who's working on this uh, project, John Nagorski, um, and I were sitting around back in January. And he heard uh, our current president's inauguration speech and was just you know, hands and head upset and saying, you know, this was the worst inauguration speech in history. You know, it was so bad, yada, yada. I was like, you know, was it really that different? Was it really the worst? I'm a statistician, prove it, right? Like, because I don't, I don't believe anything, so, so prove this to me. I, I really want to see this. So John, being John, goes and downloads the speeches of all inauguration speeches in presidential history. <laughs> and, um, and we also included, just to have a better sample size, the State of the Union speeches as well. Okay? And then we process these into a bag of word document using basic text mining. And we did this in a way to, we didn't do a very sophisticated way at all. We wanted to not bias the results at all. Okay? So basic things like everything's lowercase, remove the white space, stop words, um, stem words. So for example, like big, bigger, biggest are all um, stem to the word big and so forth. We filter to the top. 75 words that have the most variance across the uh, set of 45 US presidents. And we did a simple log transform and center and scaling. Okay, so very, very, very basic 
uh, text processing here. And here are the results of our dendrogram using CARP. Oh, and it's kind of hard to see here. I'm sorry that it's kind of hard to see. But we see basically there's a big cluster here that looks very well separated from everybody else. And if you can see all of these, all of these are the post-World War II presidents. Okay? Some of these clusters over here, like for example, oh, I, I can't see, but over here are founding fathers. These are between World War I and World War II. So there's actually, uh, these actually group really, really well according to time period. So just looking at 75 words, you can separate presidents according to time period. So you're asking about Trump. He's the last president to join this group of modern presidents, but he's still in the group of modern presidents, right? Pretty well separated. Who's this guy right here? Woo, that looks like an outlier. That is Warren Harding. And so when we did this analysis, how, do, do you, anybody know Warren, Warren Harding in here? Anyway, 1920s president. I didn't, know, I didn't know too much about him at all when we did this analysis. I went and looked him up, and I Googled Warren Harding. And the second Google result after Wikipedia was worst inauguration speech in US history. <laughs> Warren Harding. Right? So, um, I did go back and read his speech, but whatever he said, he is a massive, massive outlier that's very apparent in this data set. Um, just to show you a comparison to hierarchical clustering, this is using Euclidean distance and complete linkage, which is the default setting in R. Um, we get a cluster, uh, a dendrogram that looks like this. It's quite a bit different than our CARP results, and particularly there are some disturbing results. So these are not grouped according to timeline well at all. But this cluster right here, there's George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, James Madison, John Adams, and Donald Trump in that <laughs> cluster over there. So somehow, Trump was placed with our founding fathers, the first war presidents <laughs> using hierarchical clustering, which um, I would argue is probably not a, a good or optimal clustering result, right? Um, but we can also, using our techniques, because they're very fast, plot, um, make movies of how your data forms clusters. And what you're looking at here is because this is in 75 dimensional space, we're plotting the first principal component versus the second principal component. So you can visualize these in 2D space. And each data point, of course, is one of the 45 presidents. And the red lines are the clustering solution paths. So you definitely see that Trump is off kind of, he might be a potential outlier, but he does join with this group of modern presidents. If you look, he joins last, but he does join that group of modern presidents here. Okay, so with some interesting things. We also have methods that you, side by side you can watch as the clustering paths are formed and as you go up the dendrogram, the height of the dendrograms at which those groups are formed. Uh, we do have a Shiny app where you can I interact with this and click on specific clusters and say you want you know, five clusters or four clusters and stop this at points and, and interact with it. We can also do this for convex by clustering here. So this is the same data set. What you're looking at here on the columns are the 45 different US presidents, and on the rows are 75 words. And you definitely see groups being formed. So notice as we increase lambda and play movies of this, both rows and columns are fusing together, which means groups of presidents and groups of words are forming together. And if we stop this movie for just a second, um, so there's actually some very interesting, it's very hard to read, sorry about this lighting here. Some of these words that older presidents, sorry, I shouldn't say older, I should say um, uh, historical presidents uh, <laughs> were saying, um, are things like, um, uh, are, are things like uh, Indian, treaty, vessel, Spain, Britain, you know, so forth. Um, some of the modern presidents' uh, words were also interesting, things like women, Soviet, nuclear, ballistic actually showed up over here, as said more often by the uh, modern presidents. Uh, Trump, just in case you're wondering, is right here. So he is the last to join this group of modern presidents. But some of his words that he said most often were quite comical. Um, it was, get job today, Mexico, were his four most common words. So um, uh, anyway, so. Uh, there was definitely some interesting little findings here from this, from this data set. Um, we do have uh, some uh, shiny apps that allow you to interact with this 
And um, eventually, we are going to be releasing, hopefully very soon, a Clustar Viz package, which will allow you to use these techniques on your own data set and also create your own interactive or dynamic movies to allow you to watch your data form clusters and buy clusters. Um, and I should say this is uh, largely the work of my PhD student who is graduating soon, actually in December, John Nagorski, um, and some references for you. Thank you very much. We have time for a couple of questions uh, while we get set up with our next speaker. So any questions? And then Ginevra already answered my question. There will be code available, of, you know, because I saw you in R, so there's already code out there ready to, to be downloaded. Uh, yes, we're, we will release an R package uh, shortly. Um, it will be cluster viz. It, it, you can always find it from my website. If, okay. Yeah. okay, very good. Any uh, questions for Ginevra? She answered all your questions. You just want to go back and run the code and, and read the speeches. Okay. With that, let's thank her again. Thank you.